Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Tsitsigalanos. I am the executive manager of the World Stroke Academy, the education platform of the World Stroke Organization that provides stroke education to health professionals worldwide. Now, it is with great pleasure that I'm hosting this educational activity today for you on ISU's latest advances and research priorities with exceptional speakers sharing their expertise on the topic. Um, like always, uh, before introducing today's moderators and speakers, uh, we will have a quick look at some of the housekeeping rules here on Zoom. Of course, we welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those in your Zoom control panel. We will have a 15 minute discussion at the end so we can uh, cover all of your questions. We also have prepared some poll questions that we invite you to participate in. You can just vote as soon as the poll pops up on your screen. You can, of course, use the chat box to um, say hi or just to leave your feedback throughout the webinar. Um, I also want you to know that this webinar is recorded and we are also live streaming on YouTube at the moment. Um, and the recording link will be sent out to you via email shortly after the webinar. Uh, lastly, I kindly invite you to fill in the evaluation survey that will also pop up on your screen at the end of the webinar. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to these moderators, Hans Christoph Tinner, Professor of Neurology and Chairman of the Department of Neurology and Co-Chairman of Non-Surgical Intensive Care Medicine at the University of Duisburg, Essen, Germany, and Simona Sacco, Professor of Neurology at the University of L'Aquila and Director of the Local Clinical Neurology and Stroke Unit Department. Welcome to both. Hello. Hello. Good, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my task is to introduce this seminar on ESUS. And I would like to start with uh, a short story. Almost 10 years ago, Bob Hart and I decided we wanted to run a randomized trial in cryptogenic stroke comparing a NOAC with aspirin. And we designed a protocol and sent it to the Food and Drug Administration for approval and had a hearing. And at this hearing at the Food and Drug Administration, they told us you want to study cryptogenic stroke. And cryptogenic stroke means you don't know what the cause of stroke is. So you are idiots. Go home because you cannot do a trial in something where you don't know what it is. And this is why Bob Hart and myself, we brought together a group of 60 stroke neurologists, cardiologists, and we developed this concept of ESUS, as you know, embolic stroke of undetermined source, which was published in Lancet Neurology. And we are now much more advanced in this issue of ESUS. And therefore, we have uh, three very dedicated speakers today. And uh, the first talk is about atrial cardiopathy and ESUS from Human Kamel. He is from the Cornell University in the United States. He is a stroke physician. And we will start with the first polling question before the presentation starts. So please tick one of the answers. What finding does not support the concept of atrial cardiopathy as a cause of stroke independent of atrial fibrillation or flutter? Okay. So, oh, this is, they are equally distributed. And uh, I hope, Homan, that you can uh, comment in your talk and after your talk about these results. So let's go to your presentation, Homan. All right, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'll share my screen. And can everyone see my slides okay? Yes. All right, great. So. I'll be talking today about uh, atrial cardiopathy and, and ESIS. And before I start here, my disclosures, 
And the, you know, the motivation for, for um, a lot of the research on this topic of atrial cardiopathy is related to um, cryptogenic stroke, as, as Dr. Dino pointed out, that, you know, I think a lot of people in the field find it um, uh, striking and frustrating that, you know, in about one-fifth or one-sixth of strokes, uh, even in the modern era, we can't pinpoint an exact mechanism. But we do know clinically, radiographically, that these um, these cryptogenic strokes are almost always uh, appear embolic. And that's why um, Dr. Wiener and others put forth this, this uh, construction of ESIS, which I think has been very helpful for the field by, by clarifying that issue and sort of creating a, a framework for how to you know, work up a patient. Uh, and I think what I want to focus on is, you know, if, if these uh, strokes are embolic strokes of undetermined source, what are the potential sources of emboli? And one that uh, I think often comes to mind is the idea of subclinical atrial fibrillation. So, you know, paroxysmal, asymptomatic atrial fibrillation um, it could definitely be a source for these strokes because the patient may be in sinus rhythm by the time they're being evaluated for their stroke. And we know from several uh, randomized clinical trials that if, if we look for, uh, for paroxysmal AFib with continuous heart rhythm monitoring, we will not uncommonly uh, detect it in patients who've had a cryptogenic stroke. You can see here, this is from the Crystal AF trial, about 30% of patients had subclinical AFib after cryptogenic stroke uh, within uh, three years of their stroke. On the other hand, though, um, the, this trial also makes it clear that the majority of patients with cryptogenic stroke or ESIS don't have atrial fibrillation. And another puzzling aspect of, of the link between AFib and stroke is that there's, a, there's an association between a single isolated episode of AFib. So a six minute episode of AFib in the ASSERT study, um, which enrolled about 2,500 patients with, you know, who had an implanted uh, cardiac device that could monitor their rhythm. A single uh, episode of AFib was associated with stroke months down the line, which doesn't really make sense if you think of AFib as the actual cause of stroke, right? How can six minutes today cause stroke several months later. And even more puzzling, when the assert, the assert investigators dug deeper into their data, they found that, that in a third of the patients who had both stroke and AFib, um, they, these patients had no AFib before their stroke. They were monitored for about uh, an average of a year before their stroke. There's no AFib on the device. They had their stroke, and then AFib appears for the first time afterwards. And as they themselves pointed out, this, this lack of temporal association, the association between brief AFib episodes and stroke months later, uh, calls into question the current understanding of how AFib causes stroke. And the relationship is probably more complicated than just an issue of the dysrhythmia leading to stasis and, and clot formation. So I think the first uh, line of evidence supporting the idea of atrial cardiopathy as having a role in stroke is this, is this um, lack of temporal association between AFib and stroke and the association between very brief episodes of AFib and stroke. And it brings up the idea that AFib itself may just be the tip of the iceberg. We know that AFib doesn't happen de novo. It usually happens in the setting of a lot of age and disease related remodeling of the left atrium. And could it be, you know, we know that the, the, this abnormal atrial substrate or atrial cardiopathy plays a role in AFib-related stroke in patients who have AFib? Uh, and could it be that the atrial substrate can cause AFib even before, uh, can cause stroke even before AFib uh, appears? And, and in support of that, you know, we and others have done uh, studies finding links between markers of abnormal atrial substrate and the risk of stroke independently of atrial fibrillation, or even in patients who don't have any apparent a, a fib, um, and, and these, these studies collectively, I think, support the idea that, that you can have a thrombogenic atrial cardiopathy that can lead to stroke even before a fib uh, develops. Um, I think in, in further support of that, the links between markers of atrial cardiopathy and stroke appear to be stronger for, for embolic appearing strokes. We had a recent paper for, from the cardiovascular health study where we found that uh, abnormal left atrial mechanics uh, using strain echocardiography uh, were associated with subsequent ischemic stroke 
but even more strongly with cardioembolic stroke and, and especially strongly with afibrillated, future afibrillated cardioembolic stroke. So based on all this data, we, we put together this construct that, um, you know, instead of the prevailing paradigm, which, which held that you had vascular risk factors and aging that led to um, abnormal atrial substrate, that then led to AFib and that it was the AFib that then led to stroke, we, we propose this alternative model where in some cases the atrial cardiopathy may lead to stroke directly without intervening AFib. And we think that this model better explains some of the data I presented to you. You know, why the, the only a minority of patients with, with embolic appearing stroke have uh, AFib, even if you monitor them for years after their stroke. Why, why would you just have uh, an association between six minutes of AFib today and the risk of stroke months later, it doesn't make sense if AFib is required for the stroke to happen, but it does make sense if you think of the, the atrial cardiopathy being upstream and it causes AFib today and then a few months later causes stroke, even though there's no active AFib at the time. And lastly, and most importantly, why are some of these strokes happening before AFib is manifest for the first time? Uh, it, it only makes sense if you think of a more upstream, you know, atrial cardiopathy that's, that's um, first causing the stroke and then the AFib is happening later and it's a, a lagging marker. So we, we think this, this construct better explains the data that's out there. Um, and I think, you know, it's not just um, interesting from a conceptual point of view, but it also has therapeutic implications because we know anticoagulation works to prevent stroke in AFib. And, and it's plausible given the sort of parallels that it would also work to prevent stroke in patients who have atrial cardiopathy, but haven't had uh, AFib yet. There's some very interesting preliminary data to that effect. So from the Navigate ESIS trial, one of the trials that Dr. Diener was talking about where, where all patients were, with ESIS were enrolled and randomized to oral anticoagulants or, or, or aspirin, you know, even though the results of, of Navigate ESIS were neutral, if you look at the subgroup that had left atrial enlargement on the echocardiogram, there, there appears to be a benefit of rivaroxaban in preventing stroke relative to aspirin. Now, these are post hoc and, and sort of hypothesis generating. Um, we're doing the Arcadia trial right now in, in the US and Canada to try to really test this hypothesis of a, of a uh, thrombogenic atrial cardiopathy. And we are enrolling patients who, with ESIS meet one of these biomarker criteria for atrial cardiopathy, and then randomizing them to apixaban uh, or aspirin and following them for recurrent stroke. And as of today, we have 759 of the 1,100 um, patients that we're, we're trying to enroll. And we're hoping to finish recruitment by the end of 2022 and to have data by mid-2024. Uh, I wanted to sort of end, I know um, Dr. Snemmel is going to talk a lot more about the these short runs of AFib, but I think I just wanted to sort of better uh, position what we're trying to do in Arcadia um, in relation to the arrhythmia itself, of, of AFib itself, because I don't think the AFib is, is just a bystander. And there was a nice study to that effect recently by the, uh, Rod Passman and others, where they did a case control study, a case co um, a crossover study. They identified a group of patients who just had a stroke. They looked at the risk of AFib detected on a, on a device in the 30 days before the stroke versus the 90 to 120 days before the stroke. And they, they enrolled about, about um, uh, 809, about 900 patients who had some kind of pacemaker or cardiac defibrillator um, and, and who'd had a stroke. And what they found is that if you look at the, the 30 days before the stroke, um, there are significantly more patients uh, with AFib in that case period than there were, um, uh, and, and no AFib in the control period, than you find in the control period. And it's about eight times more common to have AFib immediately preceding the stroke. And you can see here the sort of graphic representation of that, that the, the odds ratio for stroke uh, seems to be significantly elevated in the few days after someone has an AFib episode compared to their own control period a few months before their stroke. Uh, and, and the authors uh, point out that these results are consistent with the traditional view that AFib uh, is a causal risk factor for ischemic stroke um, rather than just a risk marker. Uh, 
although they point out that these two things are not mutually exclusive. And I think that's where the real synthesis here is here. Um, you know, clearly the AFib plays a role in worsen stasis and can transiently you know, increase the risk of thromboembolism. But most of the patients in the study, even though, you know, most of them had thrombolic strokes, didn't have AFib in the, in the 30 days before their stroke. So there's, I think both these things are at play. The, the atrial substrate can cause stroke, but also the atrial fibrillation is not benign. Um, and in our model, we kind of, I think, you know, we have this arrow here. And, and the way we're thinking of, of Arcadia is that, you know, these patients are going along in time due to aging and vascular risk factors. They develop an atrial cardiopathy, and then they can develop a fib on top of that. And that transiently increases the risk of stroke when patients are in a fib. And what we're trying to do in Arcadia is to say, can we reduce this risk here from the atrial cardiopathy? Um, before the AFib occurs, or even in some patients, you know, even if the AFib never happens, can we reduce the risk of stroke from the abnormal atrial substrate? And it's really exciting that there's other uh, investigators looking at this. Mira Katan and others are doing a trial in Europe where they're looking at another marker of atrial cardiopathy, mid-regional pro-AMP. They're looking at all stroke patients, which I think is also a very you know, interesting approach. And, and so hopefully there'll be, you know, many trials coming down the line looking at this idea of atrial cardiopathy. And there's just a lot of really exciting treatments on the horizon for preventing uh, cardiac embolism. So I feel like the more we can understand the links, you know, the exact sources of cardiac embolism, the more uh, therapeutic implications um, there will be. So I will stop there and hopefully that helped address some of the, the poll questions uh, for you all. Yeah, thank you very much for this great talk. We have a, a second uh, polling question. And uh, so what is the most immediate therapeutic implication of the concept of atrial cardiopathy as a cause of stroke independent of atrial fibrillation? So you have one choice. Okay, can we have the results? Homan, your comment? That's great, yeah. No, I think that's very much it. That, um, you know, I think the, the, what we're trying to test in Arcadia, what, they're, what you know, the Moses trial is trying to test is the idea of, you know, can you anticoagulate these patients and see a benefit the same way we see in AFib? So that's, that's exactly right. Good, and please uh, submit your questions to this talk, to the, uh, question and answer part. And with this, uh, I hand over to my co-chair, Dr. Simona Sacco from Italy. Thanks, uh, Chris. Thanks. Uh, and uh, we can uh, go on with uh, this webinar. Now it's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, the second speaker is uh, George Entaios. George is a specialist in internal medicine, but has a huge expertise in stroke. He works in Greece at the University of Thessaly. The topic of uh, his talk, uh, it's, uh, it's very important, uh, sopracardiac atherosclerosis and uh, ISUS. Uh, we, we know now well that uh, not uh, all uh, ISUS uh, come from uh, the heart, from occult uh, atrial fibrillation. And so I think this topic, it's uh, very welcome. Can I have the first uh, poll um, question? Okay. So the question is, uh, how frequent uh, is the incidence of a complex uh, aortic arch atherosclerosis uh, in uh, ISUS? Please make your choice. 2%, 8 15%, 30%, or 50%. Well, there's, uh, I think, an equipose between 8% uh, uh, and 50%. Uh, we will learn more uh, with uh, this talk. Please, George. Um, th thank you very much. 
it's more, it's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, Chris and Human and Renate and the truly international audience. I see at the chat room that this is really an international audience. Very glad to be here. Also, many thanks to Laura for organizing this and to the World Stroke Academy and the World Stroke Organization for giving us the chance to discuss about issues, uh, which is uh, not there at all. Um, uh, which is not rare at all. Uh, in about 17 to 20 percent of our patients, uh, we cannot decide with a decent level of certainty what is the underlying cause of uh, stroke. And these are the strokes that we used to call them cryptogenic, but uh, as Chris Diner said, uh, nowadays we call those patients as issues, as symbolic strokes of undetermined source. And there may be uh, several causes of stroke in these patients, um, uh, like, for example, uh, atrial fibrillation or perhaps atrial cardiopathy, as Schumann mentioned, but also uh, another cause which was uh, a bit underestimated in the beginning were atherosclerotic plugs in the arteries that uh, supply the brain. And this is what we uh, nowadays tend to uh, to describe as supracardiac atherosclerosis. That means atherosclerosis in, in any vessel, in any artery going up to the brain, in, starting from the aortic arch and then going to the carotis, to the vertebral basilar system, extracranial, intracranial. Uh, so any artery uh, going to the brain uh, having an atherosclerotic plaque may be a cause of stroke in an issues patient. Um, this is uh, more or less what we used to call as large atherosclerotic strokes, but there is a, a slight uh, but meaningful uh, difference. Uh, uh, back in the 90s, when the TOS classification was introduced, there was this uh, criterion which uh, mentioned that if you would like to call your patient as an atherosclerotic stroke, then you should have a, a stenosis, a carotid or vertebrobasilar stenosis of at least 50% uh, degree. And uh, I guess that uh, most of you would agree that this is rather an arbitrary uh, number, an arbitrary threshold, without any really deep and, uh, deep and solid uh, pathophysiologic basis. There, there are some uh, studies, many studies actually, showing that uh, the higher the degree of the stenosis, the, the, the higher the stroke ri risk is for the patient. But for example, have a look at this graph. On the vertical axis is the, uh, the risk of your patient having an ischemic stroke, depending on the, on the level of the carotid stenosis, which is on the horizontal axis. And you see here the, the threshold of 50% that we use to define a patient as atherosclerotic stroke in the toast classification. But uh, at least uh, I don't see any, any really sharp increase, any steep increase at the 50% threshold. I would, I would see something like that, like that at the 70% threshold where you see really a steep increase in the stroke risk above the 70% uh, stenosis, but I don't see anything steep at the 50% threshold. So uh, I, I really uh, argue that this is rather an arbitrary threshold and not really very meaningful in terms of uh, clinical praxis. And um, uh, it, is, it is not uh, rare to see a patient who has a, a, an atherosclerotic plug, a supracardiac atherosclerosis of less than 50%. And uh, as it was shown at the Q&A, uh, you may find the complex aortic arch atherosclerosis in about 8% of all our issues patients. You can see an intracranial atherosclerotic plug less than 50% in 13% of our patients and uh, about 40% uh, in the carotid uh, vasculature and in the vertebral basilar circulation. So it's not rare at all to have a patient with supracardiac uh, atherosclerosis. Now, uh, how can we uh, argue that these uh, non-stenotic plaques are causally associated with the uh, index stroke. We can, uh, we can make a hypothesis. If somebody would uh, argue that these are uh, absolutely not related to stroke, uh, that is, they, they are just a random finding, then you would expect that these plaques, these non-stenotic plaques would be equally distributed on the ipsilateral side, ipsilateral to the stroke, and to the contralateral to the side, to the stroke side. Uh, but this doesn't seem to be the case. There are uh, several studies nowadays showing that uh, these non stenotic carotid plaques are more frequently found in the ipsilateral to the stroke site rather than quadrilateral. This is uh, one of those. This comes from the Navigate Issues trial. That, uh, this was one of the trials that uh, Christina mentioned before. And um, 
this was an analysis of, uh, of the prevalence of those non-stenotic carotid plaques, ips lateral versus contralateral to the issues. Go to the, uh, to the lower row, you see, for example, that in the carotid stenosis analysis on the left side, patient had an ips lateral stenosis in approximately 51% of the overall population compared to only 17% plaques at the contralateral side, approximately three to one. And similar numbers are uh, were found at the carotid plug analysis, where again, the numbers were 65 versus 8%. So this, this uh, generates the hypothesis that uh, the fact that these plaques are not evenly distributed across the ips lateral and the contralateral sides of stroke, there's, there is something there in terms of causal association. And uh, there are other studies, as I mentioned, and this is a nice meta-analysis where uh, it shows exactly this, that uh, uh, there is approximately five to six uh, times higher likelihood that these non stenotic carotid plaques have found ips lateral compared to the contralateral side of uh, patients with issues for cryptogenic, depending on the definition that we used in, uh, in each uh, study. And it's also the case for the intracranial vasculature. This is a nice study by Dr. Cheng uh, from China, where again, the, the intracranial plaques were more frequently found ipsilateral to issues rather than quadrilateral. So there's really a lot of emerging uh, evidence showing that there is something deeper there, a, a, a stronger causal association that, than we initially thought that uh, there was. So uh, let's assume, let's, let's take the example that we have a patient and this patient uh, um, uh, has no identifiable cause of stroke, uh, we didn't manage to find any uh, meaningful duration of atrial fibrillation, and this patient has, for example, 40% carotid stenosis, if lateral to the stroke. How, how can we identify that perhaps this is associated with the, with the index stroke? Uh, back in the 90s, when the dose classification was introduced, we didn't have the sophisticated imaging that we do have nowadays, but uh, now we have uh, higher abilities and we can have a much better look at the plaques, at the atherosclerotic plaques and, and judge whether this look uh, ugly or not. And uh, for example, we can uh, use uh, CT, we can use MRI, we can use ultrasound, and then we can use several parameters uh, for uh, for this imaging modality, like for example, to see if there is intra-plug hemorrhage, to see the lipid reach, necrotic core of the plug, if there's no vascularization, the carotid plug thickness, uh, the surface morphology, the carotid plug volume. So there are several characteristics, several imaging parameters that we can assess from different imaging modalities and have a look whether this uh, plug is really uh, ugly looking uh, or not. Uh, which one to choose? Uh, there are pros and cons for each diagnostic modality. For example, the ultrasound is widely available. It's, uh, it's very good to, to measure the, the plug, but it's not that good to assess the, the characteristics of the plug, the intraplug hemorrhage, the necrotic, or the fibrous cap. Uh, the MRA and the CTA are much better for uh, to see if, if, you're, if, you're, if this plug of your patient has uh, an ulceration and preferably the, uh, the CT geography. And then we can use the MRI, which is the ideal uh, method to see the characteristics of the plug, the interplug hemorrhage, the necrotic or the fibrous uh, cap. You can also think of using a, a PET CT to see whether there is inflammation in the plug, but this is not really uh, very uh, easy to do in, uh, in routine clinical practice. So there are different imaging modalities that you may use. Which one should you use? Uh, I would say uh, we should choose the one that uh, our center has the, uh, the greatest expertise with. So if, if your radiology department has a strong expertise with MRI, perhaps that's the, that's the modality that you should use. Or for example, if it's on ultrasound or CT, whatever. So uh, I think that we need to discuss with our radiologists and, uh, and uh, um, have a common uh, uh, discussion and opinion on the characteristics of the plug and how to assess uh, uh, those. So let's continue with our example. So we do have a patient with a 40% carotid stenosis, it's lateral to the stroke, uh, we didn't find any other cause. It doesn't look very pretty, this uh, plug. So how can we uh, help our patients? What can we offer more than the standard of care? Uh, 
And perhaps uh, somebody could consider that we should go uh, uh, more uh, uh, aggressively to these patients and perhaps do some arterial intervention like endarterectomy, like standing. Um, we do have a subgroup analysis of the of the classic trials of endarterectomy, and uh, there's this uh, uh, this subgroup analysis in patients who had uh, a cardiac stenosis between 30 and 49 percent, and you see that compared to the standard of care of that time, endarterectomy didn't make any difference at all. So we don't have really no evidence at all to support that we should uh, operate uh, or intervene to these uh, plugs. But still, uh, this, this, these trials are about 20 years uh, old now. Uh, the standard of care has changed. The techniques, the interventional techniques have changed. So we don't really know if these results are valid nowadays. But at the, at the end of the day, we don't have any evidence to support that we should operate those patients. But still, there is a discussion about that point, and this comes from the latest uh, guidelines of the, uh, the vascular guidelines, the European vascular guidelines, where you see that uh, they suggest that in patients with less than 50% stenosis who report recurrent symptoms, it may be reasonable to consider carotidotarectomy or steading. So you see a really hesitant uh, uh, suggestion. It may be reasonable to consider it very, very uh, uh, hesitant words. So, uh, but, but still there's something that we may consider for those patients. Now, what about uh, antithrobotics for those patients? Uh, again, there's no evidence that we should go uh, on the anticoagulant side of uh, antithrobosis for those patients. First of all, there's no pathophysiological basis. Uh, these are white clots, arterial clots. They tend to respond better to antiplatelets rather than anticoagulants in terms of pathophysiology. But also uh, from a, uh, an analysis of subgroup uh, of subgroups of randomized trials of anticoagulation versus antiplatelets in patients with carotid plaques. Again, we see uh, that, that there is uh, obviously no benefit to anticoagulate those patients. If somebody would see a trend, it would be towards the other side to antiplatelets. So we shouldn't anticoagulate those patients. Uh, as, a, as a single therapy, as a monotherapy. But we, perhaps we could think of uh, combining uh, antithrobotic approaches, and this is based on the COMBAS trial. The COMBAS trial was the trial of uh, low dose rivaroxaban plus uh, aspirin versus aspirin as monotherapy in patients with stable atherosclerotic disease. So we see that there was a huge reduction of uh, ischemic stroke, 50% reduction of relative risk, a huge uh, reduction. But of course, there was, on the other side, an increase in major bleeding, a 70% increase in major bleeding. So uh, uh, the dual thrombotic treatment with a low dose of rivaroxaban plus aspirin reduced the, uh, the, uh, the, the stroke risk, but increased the bleeding risk. But if you combine those uh, outcomes into a single outcome, including uh, ischemic and bleeding events, you see this net clinical benefit outcome of cardiovascular death, stroke, MI, fatal bleeding or symptomatic bleeding, then it goes again towards uh, the right direction, the direction of low dose of varoxaban plus aspirin, and it was statistically significant. So it seems that Probably uh, in patients with atherosclerotic stroke, atherosclerosis, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, meaningful and uh, clinically relevant to uh, offer this treatment decision. But, but there's a, a large uh, uh, objection here. The patients with carotid stenosis were not included in this trial uh, by themselves. They, were, they, they could be included if they had also concomitant peripheral artery disease, but not uh, per se. So we don't have any really strong evidence on patients with uh, those patients that we discuss with carotid atherosclerosis to support this. So uh, we cannot recommend it, but there is something that this is something that we could uh, think of. Now somebody would uh, ideally see uh, a chance here for a new molecule that a new anticoagulant molecule that perhaps could uh, could have a, a, a superior safety profile compared to rivaroxaban. So in that case, it could uh, 
keep on reducing the ischemic risk without increasing the major bleeding risk. And perhaps this could be the, the, the new class of uh, molecules which uh, are uh, around the corner, the factor 11 uh, inhibitors like Milvexin, for example. And there are such trials like the axiomatic where uh, in patients who have uh, atherosclerosis, supracardiac atherosclerosis, the addition of uh, the factor 11 inhibitor to the standard of care, that is aspirin, clopidogrel, in patients with minor stroke or TIA, it might prove to be of benefit for those patients. But this uh, remains to be seen in the future. And perhaps the third pillar of uh, prevention for those patients uh, should be the uh, LDL reduction. There is really very strong evidence nowadays to, to guide us and uh, persuade us that the lower the LDL, uh, the better. Patients with uh, a stroke, they are considered as very high uh, risk patients, and it is suggested that those patients should have a uh, LDL of uh, 55 milligrams per DL or even lower. And we do have the tools nowadays to reach so low uh, levels. This comes from the recommendations of the Hellenic Stroke and the uh, Hellenic Atherosclerosis Society, uh, where, uh, as, as in the myocardial infarction, first we start with a, a high dose statin. Uh, combined with azetimibe, and if we don't uh, uh, make it to the 55 uh, milligrams per DL, then we may consider a PCSK9 inhibitor. So to summarize everything uh, regarding supercardiac atherosclerosis and issues, it seems that the association is stronger than it was initially considered, uh, that supercardiac atherosclerosis is more, frequent, more frequently found if it's lateral to the stroke, rather than contralateral. We do have nowadays this sophisticated imaging that we need to identify those high-risk uh, plugs. It is still unclear what is the ideal antithrombotic treatment for those patients, but we do know that we should go uh, very low with LDL levels for those patients. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, George, for uh, this uh, really nice uh, and important uh, presentation. I can see that uh, there are uh, questions uh, coming and uh, we will uh, answer all of them uh, uh, at the end of the session after the last uh, speaker. Uh, now, before uh, going on, we have uh, the, the poll question. So which is the optimal diagnostic modality to assess intraplaque hemorrhage at the carotids? MRI, MR angiography, CT, CT angiography, ultrasound. Please make your choice. Well, majority MRI, but MR angiography is very close. George, what's your comment about this? Yeah, I think I would agree with, a, with this 36% of our colleagues who voted for the first choice. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I hand over to Chris for introducing the last speaker. Yeah, thank you very much. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Renate Schnabel. She is from the famous Heart Center at the University of Hamburg. And her topic is short runs of atrial fibrillation and ischemic stroke. And we will also start with a polling question. So during 72-hour monitoring of a 75-year-old man with hypertension, diabetes, and recent issues, two brief episodes of rapid irregular atrial activity of 12 seconds are registered. What would you do next? So all anticoagulation, combination with antiplatelet therapy, intensified search for AF, or ignore it. Send the patient home. Okay, can we see the results? 
So, Renate, what is your comment? Yeah, very good. Let's discuss. This is not an easy question, and I would not dare to answer it completely. So, um, let's go over the slides I have put together to discuss this topic a little bit more in detail. You all know that um, that um, at, um, stroke related or atrial fibrillation related to stroke has been increasing over the last decades in men and in women. And uh, we have talked a, lo a lot about how should we deal with um, screening for atrial fibrillation post stroke. And it is uh, very clear. And I think I can also answer with these European Society of Cardiology guidelines. One of the questions that was put in the chat that in patients with ischemic stroke or TIA, we should have continuous ECG monitoring post stroke for at least 72 hours. And we can do a short term ECG recording for at least the first 24 hours. And this can usually be done uh, during the stroke unit um, stay, but it should be followed by continuous ECG monitoring for at least 72 hours whenever possible. And this can also be done in the ambulatory setting. I think this was one of the questions. And why do we recommend this? Because with the 72 hours, we have uh, we pick up a lot of new atrial fibrillation, which is probably very um, likely to have a benefit for the patient if we then change the management and start anticoagulation. So this is still pretty easy, but what we can also do is we can use a lot of monitoring and measurement methods to detect atrial fibrillation. And with variables becoming more and more available and being used also in post-stroke patients, we, have, we always see a much larger and longer time period. And we certainly detect more atrial fibrillation if we look longer and harder for atrial fibrillation compared to what we have done in the past. But we, uh, be reminded that the uh, guidelines currently recommend that the atrial fibrillation needs to be diagnosed from a 12 lead ECG recording or a single lead ECG tracing um, already is enough, but it should be 30 seconds or longer with clearly identifiable atrial fibrillation. And this is where the question about short episodes of atrial fibrillation it comes from because certainly the more intensively and the longer you screen, the more atrial fibrillation, in particular also short episodes, you will identify. But also circling back to Human Kamel's talk about atrial cardiomyopathy and the relation of atrial fibrillation episodes in, to stroke, we can clearly appreciate that um, with increasing intensity and smaller and shorter episodes of atrial fibrillation detected, the stroke risk related to those atrial fibrillation episodes certainly is much less than on a single ECG where we, de where we detect atrial fibrillation. This is a recent study, a study which is more or less proof on concept. If you implant a, a device, an implantable loop recorder versus, and this was done with an external loop recorder, so more intensive atrial fibrillation search post-stroke, you will still over a 365 days period detect more atrial fibrillation, 15.3 versus 4.7% in post-stroke patients. Uh, what has also been done using three um, separate holter, so prolonged um, um, atrial fibrillation monitoring through holter ECGs. And what you see here in this study by Rolf Wachter is that you indeed identify more atrial fibrillation at six months, 9%, at 12 months, 6.9%. You see over time, the difference decreases and um, atrial fibrillation in patients with AF will also be detected clinically, not only by intensified monitoring. You see in the first holter, you identify um, the majority of cases, but also on the second holter and the third holter, you will not find more cases, but you still, you will find some additional cases. And indeed, there may be um, an advantage. This study was not powered for outcomes, but there may be an advantage if you start anticoagulation and you can reduce the risk of recurrent stroke. You can also put in a loop recorder, such as in the loop study, which was presented at um, in, uh, end of August during this year's European Society of Cardiology annual conference. And what the authors could clearly show in patients at risk 
of stroke and post stroke patients even that enrolling 6000 patients um, they could identify more atrial fibrillation through an internal loop recorder 31.8 percent versus 12 percent over time but what you can see here that this uh, incidence curves for stroke or systemic arterial embolism um, did go apart, but not sufficiently to reach the primary endpoint of this study. And I would like to show you a subgroup analysis. Here you see a similar uh, scheme uh, across um, all uh, subgroups, but you could not see um, real benefit in post-stroke patients in Denmark when you do um, prolonged intensified monitoring over three years or more based on a very high uh, background care post-stroke certainly. What do you do if you do a more a not a so, a so intensive screening, but for example, and this was another big screening trial in the community, the stroke stop study, but just an example here, they did a two times um, a daily monitoring over um, two weeks and they've identified atrial fibrillation. But we, what you will also find is short episodes of a rapid irregular atrial activity. They call it micro AF which I think is a nice uh, term. And what do you do with patients um, who have micro AF, who do not fulfill the uh, guideline recommended criteria? And what they could demonstrate is that if there is micro AF uh, present in patients and you do a little bit more of screening, you will identify atrial fibrillation that um, it goes along with current guidelines. But what should you do with these patients? Another study here uh, showed, uh, this is again with pacemaker or implant uh, device uh, patients, shows that there is not so much of a progression as we would have thought in the past for the natural history of atrial fibrillation. But you see that over it's only six months period, the, the pattern of um, atrial fibrillation remains fairly similar in these patients. Certainly, uh, there are characteristics that are related to the length of the atrial fibrillation episodes, such as uh, male sex, number of comorbidities, waist circumference, creatinine, uh, class one antiarrhythmic drugs, statin use, and left ventricular mass. So predictors of longer episodes. Well, you will also meet um, high um, episodes of atrial fibrillation that do not uh, translate, is necessarily directly translate into classical atrial fibrillation is in uh, pacemaker patients or patients with implanted devices. What should you do with those? Ideally, you would identify atrial fibrillation on a 12 lead ECG in these patients, but atrial fibrillation is intermittent. So if you don't find atrial fibrillation on the 12 lead ECG and cl cannot clinically detect atrial fibrillation, what would you do? And this is a survey and people were asked what they would do if they identified such atrial high rate episodes. And um, in male patients uh, with a chat score of one, only 10% would anticoagulate with a single run, um, about 37% would anticoagulate with multiple runs. Maybe let's go to the last uh, columns on the right hand side In patients with recent ischemic stroke for which no potential cause has been identified 79% of um, individuals um, here asked would anticoagulate a single run and 90 89% almost 90% would anticoagulate if there are multiple runs. And this is in line with our pathophysiological thinking and um, meta-analysis data that show that indeed atrial high rate episodes appear to go along with increased risk of stroke or systemic embolism. And therefore, um, we would suggest that you should, um, if you have atrial high rate episodes, if you identify short episodes of potential atrial fibrillation, try to catch, uh, capture them with a 12 lead ECG or a Holter ECG. And then it is clear, then you fulfill the guideline criteria and you would anticoagulate. But what if uh, you cannot capture it? We know that um, the thromboembolic risk is increased to about twofold 
um, incidence, atrial high rate episode versus four to four to point five percent incidence of atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, if it becomes manifest, has a really high incidence of uh, thromboembolic events, uh, but atrial high rate episodes also also increase risk of incident heart failure or um, maze. So what should you look for? Duration of atrial high rate episodes, chest vascular comorbidities, and then decide on anticoagulation. And maybe you should use additional um, parameters that are also related to atrial cardiomyopathy, for example, like clinical characteristics, older age, cardiovascular risk factors, in particular heart failure, but also signs of atrial cardiomyopathy and left ventricular dysfunction, such as increased left atrial diameter. We saw um, the sub-analysis of the Navigate ESA study, reduced left, ejection, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, or atrial tachycardias with over 20 beats. Biomarkers, for example, we have heard about that too, or possibly also stroke etiologies, such as cryptogenic or ESA's strokes. But does this really apply for atrial fibrillation, short runs of atrial fibrillation? Currently, we cannot say. So these are all speculations. And for now, we would suggest that you should do the regular monitoring in your stroke patients, ECG monitoring, 72 hours monitoring. And in particular, if you have short runs of atrial fibrillation, this may be an indicator of prevalent atrial fibrillation if you lo look for atrial fibrillation longer and more intensively. That means do additive non-invasive ECG monitoring based on this risk stratification. And if you have short runs of atrial fibrillation, do a more intensified search for atrial fibrillation. And when you can clinically identify atrial fibrillation, then start anticoagulation if there are no contraindications. But I would be happy to discuss this topic further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now another polling question, the final one. So which answer is most likely correct? A single lead ECG tracing of more than 30 seconds showing heart rhythm with no repeating P waves and regular RR intervals when arterioventicular conduction is not impaired is diagnostic of clinical. Short runs of AEF post ESUS are not related to atrial fibrillation. Short runs of AEF are surrogates of atrial fibrillation and require oral anticoagulation in ESUS patients. And atrial high rate episodes detected from pacemaker interrogation post ESUS are sufficient to change the therapeutic management and start oral anticoagulation at full dose. Please select one. Okay, can we see the result? Then after your comment. Yeah, I would agree with this answer. It's very difficult and you see that a lot of discussion is ongoing. And I also showed you from the surveys what other uh, stroke physicians um, would do, but certainly currently the guidelines, and this is why I emphasize it, would require the clinical detection of atrial fibrillation. And this is classically single lead ECG tracing or a 12 lead ECG. Great, so thank you very much. And by this, I hand over to Simona for the question and answer session. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Chris, and thanks uh, to all the speakers uh, for uh, the really nice uh, presentations. I can see that uh, we have uh, already some uh, questions, uh, and uh, I ask uh, those uh, who, have, who are uh, following us and uh, have a question uh, to use uh, the Q&A function to ask their uh, questions. I can also see that uh, some uh, of the questions already received and answered by the speakers, but I think that anyway, it's it's good to discuss them. So uh, first question, it's for the George. Uh, the question is from Mohamed Zaki. And uh, in a symptomatic, uh, in uh, ICA subtotal occlusion with uh, good collaterals. Is it wise to interfere with the invasive procedure or leave it medically? George. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Simona. Although I think that uh, this is this is not directly related to what we we have been discussing at least at my presentation, but I think that uh, uh, the answer should be yes. Uh, we have a, a subtotal occlusion. Uh, then uh, we should uh, go aggressively with uh, uh, intervening and uh, obviously uh, taking uh, care of all uh, uh, underlying risk factors that uh, led the patient to this uh, uh, to this lesion. Thank you. Next question is for the Renate. Um, it's from Simant Chaturvedi. He agrees with the loops. Uh, uh, he asks if Renate agrees with the lab loop study conclusion that not all detected AF require anticoagulation treatment. Yeah, I think we are just started learning more about atrofibrillation. And I like to illustrate this by the monitoring time frame. You have three years of monitoring. You pick up all arrhythmias with this loop device. And what does a five minute or six minute episode of atrofibrillation that can be detected by such a loop recorder algorithm what does that mean? Does this, if there is a single episode in three years, and there are nice other publications from the group which really show that there are some patients who have single time point, have an fibrillation, and then during the whole observation period, do not, it uh, does not recur. So does this really uh, go along with an increased stroke risk? And I think that here, the concept of um, atrial cardiomyopathy as uh, introduced by Human Kamel uh, will play an increasingly important role because atrial fibrillation alone, uh, very short episodes may not carry a stroke this, that is high enough that um, anticoagulation with clear adverse side effects of increased bleeding is uh, mandated. You wonder, can I make a comment? So please, one caveat is if you have a short run of AF in a male on Monday morning, please consider this could be alcohol induced. <laughs> True. One other question for you, Renat. What about the cases of stroke induced arrhythmia, such as it in MCA insular infarction? Can it cause arrhythmia and AF and tatuzobu cardiomyopathy? Certainly, this is neurogenic or stroke-related uh, atrial fibrillation, and I would also like to hand this question further on to George, what he thinks about this, but for me, um, clearly, this is related, like um, um, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, uh, that is strokely related and um, is really to be seen in the acute setting, and therefore, it Makes, it makes it very difficult for us to decide on anticoagulation because they have longer episodes and may even need uh, um, cardioversion. And then we would um, certainly anticoagulate. But um, on the other hand, if we say it's only restricted to this acute event, we also know that if you have had a trigger like this um, cerebral infarction, and then get atrial fibrillation that this patient is very likely to get, maybe not within the next year, but in the long run, get atrial fibrillation clinically overt atrial fibrillation outside of a stroke. And therefore, these patients should at a minimum be closely monitored for clinically overt atrial fibrillation. But George, you treat um, these patients on a daily uh, basis and have to make uh, considerations in terms of would you anticoagulate those patients? So I would also be interested in what you think about this. Uh, yeah, th thanks. Uh, uh, there is there is large discussion whether these insular infections uh, they are causing uh, atrial fibrillation or not. There are studies suggesting this. Some other studies opposing this. Personally, I'm not really very very strongly convinced that there is really something there. Uh, but I would be really surprised if at some point we would uh, uh, decide about the coagulation based on whether our patient has an insular stroke or not. I think that's certainly uh, too far away, if ever. <laughs>
Thanks. Uh, uh, next question, it's uh, for the human. Uh, what about uh, the role of uh, TCD microemboli detection and uh, emboli differentiation in the management of uh, non-valvular AF? I thought that was a great question. Uh, and it, it's very appealing, I think, the idea of using microemboli as a, as a surrogate outcome of cardioembolic risk. And I know there, there's papers from several de decades ago that I know looked at um, PCD microemboli counts in AFib patients versus controls and generally found higher rates of microemboli in patients with AFib. Uh, but for some reason, you know, it just hasn't really um, been incorporated, I think, in research and clinical practice. Uh, part of it, I think, it's, you know, it's, it's operator dependent. Not every site has access to CCD. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes patients just don't have microemboli during the study, but I, I do think it's, it's a nice, uh, thing to consider, um, you know, as you're, as you're trying to work up a patient looking for uh, embolic sources. And certainly if you have bilateral emboli, that suggests a more proximal source. If you're having unilateral in a patient, maybe with like a 40% carotid stenosis that has some of the high risk plaque markers that, that George pointed out that might you know, indicate that that is a really vulnerable plaque. So I think there's, there's a lot of potential for microemboli detection, uh, more than I think we're using now. Thank you. And uh, one other question for you. Uh, what are current uh, criteria of uh, atrial cardiopathy? Have there the definite biomarkers of these uh, purely imaging-based uh, diagnosis? Yeah, I, I wish I wish I knew the answer. I don't think anyone really knows. And you know, there was a nice um, consensus document in 2017 um, that sort of you know proposed this concept of atrial cardiomyopathy. Uh, but but you know we, we don't really have prospective studies that have looked at a variety of different markers of left atrial disease and followed patients for stroke risk and tried to see what's most predictive of stroke. And so, you know, I, I think for now we have a variety of markers, either by echo, cardiac MRI, serum biomarkers, some EKG markers uh, that, and obviously AFib itself, I think is also, you can think of it as, as partly a biomarker. Um, and so uh, all these things are in play and, and I don't think we know what the best uh, definition is. And, you know, and when, we, when we were proposing the Arcadia trial, that was one of the, the, the critiques that we addressed head on. We said, look, we're not saying that our markers are definitive, but it's kind of proof of concept. You know, we're trying to enrich a population for some degree of atrial cardiopathy. And I think ultimately, I think we'll get there. We'll do the prospective studies. We'll figure out what the best combination probably of biomarkers are and, and come up with some kind of consensus definition. But for now, it, it, I, I don't think anyone really knows. Uh, human, if I may... Uh... Please, George, and then... Uh... Thanks, Mona. Uh, Human, if I may ask, uh, in case that the Arcadia or the Moses trial come out positive, don't you think that it will be uh, forced to accept the inclusion criteria of those trials as the definition of atrial cardiopathy? Yeah, I think, look, I think the, the mid-regional pro-AMP, from what I know, it's, it's a very sp you know, more specific to the left atrium, and I think if that works... And, and that can be scaled up in practice. That, that's, you know, I think a single time point blood-based biomarker is very appealing. You know, if we can, if we can get something that's, that sort of works, um, I think that's, that would be great. If we could just have a, a, you know, someone comes in with a stroke, we just get this blood test, answer comes back and uh, you're done. That would be, that would be great. There's some of the other biomarkers, you know, cardiac MRI is still challenging. Not, it's not routinely available everywhere. Echo is great, but I think a standard echo has, has some unclear um, reliability. Uh, and, and, you know, so I think a blood-based test would be great if that works. Yeah, I, th I think that uh, ISUS is really a, a great example of personalized medicine. There are so many different groups of patients within the ISUS population, and we don't know how to assess their cavities, we don't know how to assess their heart rhythm monitoring, we don't yeah. know how to assess ideally the PFOs. So it's really personalized medicine. Yeah, and, and a lot of overlap. So, you know, patients will have multiple mechanisms, and just because they had one, you know, mechanism of play today, doesn't mean that, that that'll be the same mechanism later on, although it seems to be generally the, the case. But So, so dear colleagues, yeah. I'm, I'm terribly sorry to 
stop this extremely important discussion because we are running out of time. And this gives me the opportunity uh, to thank all the speakers for these excellent presentations, to thank also Simona for, for running the discussion, and in particular the World Stroke Organization for making this kind of academy webinars available uh, for stroke uh, physicians and other physicians all over the world. So thank you very much for everyone. And with this, I hand over to Laura. Thank you very much. Um, let me go ahead and uh, put a little bit of links for you on the screen. Uh, wonderful discussion, great presentations and questions. We have some questions that were unanswered. We're going to try to uh, answer all of those and upload them on the World Stroke Academy. I want to thank our speakers. I want to thank our moderators, uh, of course. As mentioned at the beginning, a recorded version of this webinar will be shared with you. And in the meanwhile, I ask you to make sure to follow the World Stroke Academy website, as well as our Twitter and LinkedIn pages. Uh, for our upcoming webinar, uh, it will take place on December 8th at 4 p.m. CET on the topic of stroke in the very elderly. We look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. And until then, take care. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.